Hello church, if you would open to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, uh, we will look at just verse 24. The most important marriage verse in the Bible. Genesis 2.24 This is God's word. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Father, we just pray over this mystery of marriage, this glorious institution that you created. We need you to help us today because everyone here has heard of marriage, everyone has ideas of marriage, and we need all those ideas to be exalted, all the true ideas, that is, Lord, all those things that are right and good and true and pure about marriage, Lord, that you would exalt them, that you would remove all lies, and you would begin to renew our minds uh, regarding this marriage institution, Lord, we pray that you come and help us today in all the ways that we need to be helped, uh, in every way that every husband here or wife here needs to be helped. We pray that as you as the helper would come and, and supply that help. Uh, do it through the preaching of your word, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we begin today a, uh, a marriage series and I want to just clarify a few things uh, from the beginning. Uh, this is not a series where uh, we've sat down or I've sat down and just kind of listed out some important things that I think we should discuss about marriage. Um, this is what we might call an expositional series on marriage because the goal is to take uh, everything that the Bible says about marriage from front to back, at least the primary passages, and look at those in their original context. And while that, why, why that's important is because the Bible doesn't just give us what we might call propositional statements about marriage. You know, do this, don't do this. Um, the Bible uh, gives us a diversity of literary genres uh, in which to understand marriage. So we have historical narratives. We have poetry and proverbs. We have New Testament epistles. Um, we have even uh, apocalyptic literature in which to understand marriage. And, and we're going to look at all those different literary genres. Uh, we're not in a hurry in this series. Uh, I don't intend to move us quickly through this. And I want to actually give a few reasons why uh, we will move slowly and, uh, and linger on this topic of marriage for a number of weeks. I think the first thing that I would want to remind us of is that we've never really studied marriage in depth as a church. Um, we, we haven't. In, in 16, almost 16 years as a church, uh, we've never taken a real in-depth look at marriage. We did a four-week series back in 2015. We've done kind of one-off sermons on marriage here and there. Uh, it feels to me like we've studied marriage a lot more because I do a lot of marriage counseling or pre-marriage counseling and weddings and these, I talk about these things, but in terms of a corporate setting like this, uh, we, we just have not done uh, a very thorough study of this. I do think it's worth remembering that if we lived 100 years ago, we probably wouldn't do a series as long as we're going to do, um, but we don't live in those days. We live in a day in which it's very uncommon for people to come from healthy families, um, it, it once would have been the case that you would have grown up and seen a healthy marriage with your parents, probably your grandparents as well, and most others you knew would have had some sort of healthy structure uh, to their marriage. Uh, there would have been some intentionality from Christian parents to teach those things to their children. But in our day, even in Christian contexts, dysfunction, divorce, uh, plague families, and so many families that have even been married or couples that have been married for many years, many, many years even, can still be very confused as to what a healthy, God-honoring marriage even looks like. Um, 
And so the reality is that what's going on outside of the church regarding marriage is affecting all of us more than we realize or would want to admit. Um, the, the subtle or not so subtle ways that marriage is being devalued and rebelled against um, are affecting us and have affected us. And, and we need a, a good purging of our minds of, of a lot of those things and a restoring and renewing of the mind regarding the sanctity and the glory of marriage if we're going to honor the Lord in this. And I, I think that's actually our best apologetic for the culture, for a culture that's confused about gender and sexuality and marriage. The best apologetic we have isn't railing at everybody about how wrong everything is. There is a place uh, for that. But that is not our primary objective. Uh, our primary strategy is to, I think according to Ephesians 3, it says that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be displayed. So that through the church's marriages, the wisdom of God would be displayed to the watching world and they would say, it works like that. that that's something I haven't seen before. Um, and, and so we, we must go back. And, and here's, you know, any of us who've studied marriage biblically, I think the primary thing that we've noticed is that marriage is primarily a way to display the truthfulness of the gospel message. That's primarily what it's about. Um, it, it, it is not just a, a way to not be lonely in life or to, uh, to, to, to vent certain desires uh, that people naturally have. It is a way to proclaim the gospel and make much of the gospel to the culture, to the church, to our children. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter that the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. That, that is the truth of the gospel. And marriage is a primary way that we make the truth of the gospel clear to our offspring, to the church, to the world. And, and, and anybody who's taken the Bible seriously uh, on the topic of marriage has come to that conclusion. And so here's, here's what happens. Either we in our marriages are accurately embodying the headship of Christ and the submissiveness of the church, or we are misrepresenting and misteaching that. Uh, we're, we're doing one or the other because that's what marriage is to portray. You're either portraying the gospel accurately or inaccurately. You're either sending the right gospel message to those around you or you're sending the wrong gospel message to those around you. And I fear, I fear for the church at large, but even our church, that in many of our marriages, we may be sending the wrong gospel message. And the wrong gospel message is a false gospel. And our marriages can distort the gospel, even if you're teaching it, through words another way. You can contradict it through your marriage. And so here, here's why I say all of that. Because when we're studying marriage and when we take this long to study marriage, we're not just studying marriage. We're studying the gospel. And we're not just studying the gospel. Uh, we're studying the very character of God and His covenant faithfulness to His people. And we're not just studying when we study marriage uh, the character of God in the gospel. We're also getting a solid ecclesiology that is a, a, a theology of the church. Uh, what Christ is to the church. Uh, we're getting an anthropology that is the doctrine of man. What is a man? What is a woman? Um, I, I don't think everybody, every man or woman, every single man or woman has to be married. I don't think the Bible teaches that you have to be married. But I don't think you can actually rightly understand what a man is or what a woman is aside from marriage. I don't think Genesis 2 allows for that. And so studying marriage gives us a correct anthropology. And then even in parenting, we've spent all of last year, a lot of last year, studying parenting. And what, what is one of the primary things we want our kids to see in their mother and father? We want them to see a love for God. 
and we want them to see a love, how to love their neighbor. Those, are, those should be the two primary things we want our children to see in us. And who is the primary neighbor that I'm called to love? My spouse. And so I'll teach my children or not teach them how to love their neighbor by how I love or don't love my spouse. Do you see how important these things are? And I'll, I'll add one more thing to the study of marriage. It also begins to reveal how much we believe the Bible. If we really believe the Bible is God's authoritative word or not, it's a test not just to see if we can agree with Scripture and say amen on certain truths, but if we're going to be doers of the word that we profess to believe. And I've seen many times over the years people who will amen and affirm and believe all the right things and they'll condemn, especially in culture, all the wrong things, but have this inability to look in the mirror of Scripture back at themselves, especially related to marriage. And there's a high level of deception that can exist. That's why taking week after week for a few months and just looking at marriage, husband, wife, husband, wife, husband, wife, and then sitting there under that begins to do something to us. It begins to expose something about our hearts. Do I really believe God's word R related to the role of a husband, related to the role uh, of a wife? Or am I someone who humbles myself under the word of God and changes even things that may, may need to be changed? Or am I someone who hardens my heart, maybe even affirming or saying amen, but going home and ignoring these things? And so let me just give a warning here. Um, there will be things that we study in the, in the coming weeks that you will be tempted to say, Pastor John Mark is going too far with that. Uh, he's taking that too far. Uh, you will be tempted to, uh, to, to say things like, uh, that's his opinion. Um, uh, of course he would say that. He's a man. Things like that. And you know what? It's possible that as a human man preacher up here, I could say things that are just my opinion. And that's why I challenge you to bring your Bible and to test every single thing that I say and make sure it accords with Scripture. Um, I, I challenge you to fact check me, to use the original source material on marriage and make sure that what I'm saying isn't my opinion, but is in fact the very Word of God. Uh, that is necessary because there, there's always two dangers when you're listening to preaching. Uh, one of those is gullibility that you would just respect a, a preacher who's preaching or be too lazy to study it out yourself so you just believe it. Uh, or cynic, cynical spirit. Uh, a cynical receiving of the word. What do I mean by that? I, I mean that you're not really listening for truth, you're listening for errors. There's a difference. There's a way to listen for truth and you can spot errors but you want the truth because you want to obey the truth. And there's a way to listen for errors because if I can find something, I don't have to obey anything. And, and we need to be very careful about how we hear these things. And, and a qualifier as well that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that I don't think I should have to say, but, but maybe it's necessary. Uh, I hope you won't think that I'm standing up here as some sort of uh, marriage expert, that I put myself up here as some sort of marriage uh, expert. I, I, I don't think the job of the preacher is to be an authority on marriage, but to repeat what the authority on marriage has already said. Uh, that, that is my, uh, my goal. And a mentor of mine once told me that some men talk well about things that they're not good at. And other men uh, are very good at things that they can't really explain well. And I'll tell you, there's men in this church who couldn't stand here and talk very long about what the Bible says about marriage. They might struggle to explain things, but they can do it. They embody what a godly husband is, even though they can't explain it well. And I'd much rather be that man than can stand here and explain all these things and doesn't do them. Um, and so we need to be very careful how we hear these things. We want to be 
doers of the word. So every week, uh, two, two things to look for. This should be, I think, everyone's concern. Is what's being said biblical? And if it is biblical, am I doing it? Or am I changing whatever I need to change to obey what God has said? Uh, that's how we need to approach these things. Um, yesterday, I was, uh, our neighbor invited us over. They had some people come over. Uh, we didn't get a notice of this. We knock on the door. Hey, y'all want to come over today? Um, and uh, it's a Brazilian couple. Husband and wife uh, are both Brazilian, which... There aren't many Brazilians in Pensacola. The fact that God would providentially put a Brazilian couple right next to us is, uh, is quite amazing. And so we went over for this barbecue, and uh, I, try, I try really, really hard with people I don't know to not say that I'm a pastor. I, it shuts down conversation quicker than you, you would realize. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I held off for about two hours before these men that I was talking to found out what I, what I do. Um, but as soon as they found out, uh, one of the men said, uh, why is America losing its morality? And, and then another one of those men just immediately shot out, because people don't obey the scripture, because they don't want a, a standard in which to be judged by. I'm like, wow. You know, and and these, were, these were not Christian men, to my, to my knowledge. Um, and, and so I said, well, how do you know what rebellion is if you don't know what God says about sexuality and gender and marriage? How do you even know the culture is rebelling? Um, and another guy said, well, nobody actually does know about that stuff anymore. And I said, well, actually, I live my life with a people who, who do believe that God has a standard for these things, and we actually try to help each other live that out. Um, to which that caught them off guard. Um, and so I believe the best about you, church. I believe you care about what God has said about these topics, especially about marriage, and that we'll take this study serious. Let's go to Genesis 2. Let's begin to look at some of this. Um, the, the reason why we need to start in Genesis 2, it's not just because we have the origin of marriage there. Um, we need to go to Genesis 2 because all the New Testament authors that talk about marriage, they just go back to Genesis 2. They just keep going back to Genesis 2. It's very strange. Read all this stuff about marriage in the New Testament, and you just, they just keep repeating Genesis 2. Um, and that's the first thing I want us to see, that all of the Old Testament and New Testament teaching on marriage, I believe, is really just an exposition of Genesis 2. Especially Genesis 2.24. And nobody taught more about marriage than Jesus or the Apostle Paul, and they just keep going back to Genesis 2. It's like it's their interpretive approach to the topic of marriage. So let's start with Jesus on marriage. So uh, there's a passage, John or I'm sorry, Matthew 19. And this is now, he's talking about divorce, and my goal in this sermon is not to get into that. We will get into that in the future. Um, but I don't want to look at what his view is, but how does he come to his view? How does Jesus come to his view? Matthew 19, 3, the Pharisees, you remember, they're trying to test him. Uh, they're asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any reason? And listen to what Jesus says. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And then he quotes Genesis 2, 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he explains it. So, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What, therefore, God has joined together, let not man separate. So, do you see how Jesus is answering the marriage question? He's going back to Genesis 2.24. He's going back to uh, the origin of marriage. And then they come up with actually a very legitimate question. They say, well, if that's true, Jesus, then why did Moses allow for divorce in the law? Which is a very good question. And then what does Jesus say? Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, 
It was not so. It's really interesting. Two important things Jesus is doing there. One, he's treating Adam and Eve as real historical figures. Number two, he's treating their marriage as the foundation and source for all other marriages. The standard by which we would judge all other marriages. So the Pharisees say, is it lawful to divorce for any reason? Jesus says no, because the original design did not allow for that. The Pharisees say, well, why would Moses allow for divorce? And Jesus says, it's because of your hardness of heart. From the beginning, it was not so. That seems to be the interpretive principle Jesus is operating under. Um, He's showing that behind a particular, uh, we could say, prohibition or a command, we see God's original intended purpose. Let me give you some examples of of how this might apply. Take the issue of transgenderism. Transgenderism is wrong. Why? Someone may say, well, it's biology. Well, no. Uh, Yes, but but no, not ultimately. Uh, It's because God made male and female. That's it. Because God made male and female. That's the answer. That's why transgenderism is wrong. Homosexuality isn't marriage. Why? Is, that, is it legal reasons? Whether it's legal or not legal? No. Laws change. Is it because they do or don't love each other? No. That's not the reason. Why is homosexual marriage not marriage? Because God originally created a man and a woman, and he made marriage to only be for them. There is no definition of marriage apart from a male-female monogamous covenant relationship. Anything other than that is is not marriage. You can call it something else, but it's not marriage. Take the issue of polygamy. This isn't popular yet, yet, uh, in, in America. But when people start talking about that, or they start talking about marriage to animals, or robots, or other things like this, what's our answer? Our answer is Genesis 2.24. In the beginning, it was not so. That's That's our answer to all of these other Things. Now, somebody, somebody would, uh, a skeptic may say, well, why do we see Solomon or David in polygamous marriages with all these wives? What is our answer? In the beginning, it was not so. God didn't command them to do that. That was not the original design. And then again, back to the issue of divorce. Divorce is bad. Why? Because it harms kids? Because it's expensive and messy? No. Because God said they're no longer two, but one flesh. According to the original design, it was not so. Now listen to how the Apostle Paul does what Jesus did regarding marriage. Ephesians 5.31 A man shall leave his father and mother. Paul's quoting what? Genesis 2.24 A man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, he explains this as a mystery that's profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So he says marriage is about Christ and the church. How do we know that? Because it was hidden in seed form in Genesis 2.24. Not fully revealed yet, but there. Now, he takes this beyond marriage, Paul does, uh, to women's roles in the church. 1 Timothy 2.12 2.12 says, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Why? For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to get into this issue today. That's not the point. But just to show you how Paul comes to his conclusion. Why would you say women aren't to teach and to have authority in the church like this? What's your reasoning for that, Paul? Genesis 2 is the reasoning for that. The, 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 the making of the man first and the woman from the man, that there's something in that that applies even to the church. Adam was formed first, then Eve. And again, I'm not asking if you agree with that at this moment. I'm just trying to get us to see that's how the Scripture argues. That's how the conclusion is arrived at. Here's another example uh, to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 11. 
This church, again, church in Corinth, I mean, very confused sexually regarding gender, authority in the church. Uh, most were Gentile converts. They came from a very progressive pagan city. They didn't understand this stuff. And listen to the teaching on authority structures and hierarchy in the church. And I understand there's a context to head coverings, but that's not the discussion today. Uh, but listen to the argument behind it for the creation of authority. 1 Corinthians 11.3. He says, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. That the head of a wife is her husband. And that the head of Christ is God. Verse 7. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but a woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now listen to what he says right after this. In the, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, listen, so man is now born of woman. Interesting. So the woman was originally created from the man, dependent on the man. Then it flipped that now men come from where? From women, from the womb. A man enters the world via a woman. Um, that was not the way that the first happened, but every man now comes from a woman. Um, eventually, you've got two separate individuals, but then they become one and they procreate and the cycle continues. And then Paul says, all these things are from God. That's how the Spirit of God had Paul write Scripture. Which I would argue this hierarchical teaching is not rooted in the value of man over woman. That's not the point. It's not a cultural thing. It's not a thing just for the church in Corinth. This is theological. These are theological statements, not cultural statements, when he says the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. That's not cultural. That's, that's a theological statement. Verse 7, man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman for man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That's not cultural. That's theological. Pulled from Genesis 2 is what Paul is doing. And I'm aware, look, just reading those verses, I'm not even commentating on those. I'm just reading them. I, I aware you can get in legal trouble in many places just reading those verses. Um, and and we'll, uh, we're not even going to say anything about them today. I'm just trying to help us see the New Testament authors keep going back to Genesis 2 when they come to issues of gender, marriage, and sexuality. It is the foundation and source. So let's go there. Let's walk through this for a minute. Let's get our context. Genesis 1, I think actually we should see something here. There's a we might call it a, a, a creation principle, um, a, that creation is a unity with lots of diversity in the unity. I want to build that out for a second. It'll make more sense as I go through this. So in Genesis 1, God creates light. And then what does he do with light? He separates the light from the darkness. And that separation is good. It's not bad. God made the sun and moon and he separates the light from the darkness, and it's good. God separated the earth from the water, and it was good. He separated fish and animals and birds, all these things from their kind, and it was good. He, the, he creates a unity, and then he separates. And that's a principle built into creation that makes more sense when you, when you begin to think deeper on this. So, for example, a lot of people have thought deep on this. You go back to the classic philosophers, the Aristotles, the Plato's, the, um, the, the uh, Socrates, and one of the big things, if not the biggest thing that they struggled to, they wrestled with philosophically was, how is there so much unity and diversity? And what is the interplay between unity and diversity? That, that's baffled the brightest minds to, to ever live, this, this tension between unity and diversity. How can things be so similar, yet at the same time so diverse? 
And look at it in the creation of humanity. Genesis 2-7. The Lord God formed, formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made spring up every tree that is pleasant for the sight and good for food and the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's this united moral system in the tree and there's diversity. You can either eat or not eat. Uh, we've even got unity and diversity in that moral system. But then you have Adam as this unitary, undivided, alone man. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. It's not good that he only be a unity. I will make him a helper fit for him. That's an important phrase. Now out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. That phrase, fit for him, uh, we, we talk about complementarianism, complementary. Um, we use that word to describe marriage. It's embedded in verse 20 there. Helper fit for, corresponding to, complementary to the man. Not that she gives compliments with an I, compliments, but compliments with an E. They fit together. They, they complete one another. She's like him, made in the image of God, but different because she's from him and for him, a helper fit for him, it says. And even at the DNA level, we can see the sameness with diversity in genders. So man and woman are a unity that we both have an identical number of chromosomes, for example. So we're equal. But then, man and woman are different because the woman has XX chromosomes, the man XY. A newborn baby girl, for example, in her mother's room, is developing in herself, a uh, rough estimate, 2 million egg cells, which will later grow and develop later in her life, 400 or so of those maturing to become fertile. Boys' reproductive capabilities are developing in completely different ways in their mother's womb. There's diversity. There's diversity uh, uh, that's not erasable. These things cannot be changed you can't reassign a gender, in other words. There's no such thing as true reassignment surgery. You, you can't remove what God has diversified in the male and the woman, and you can't flip them. Uh, when you dig up someone's bones 100 years after death, you're going to find DNA in those bones that's, that's either male or female, and it will accord with their birth gender. Can't change that. Why? Because every cell at the cellular level has a sex to it. It's either male or female. Look back at verse 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. Many uh, speculate that this is so man couldn't take credit for what was about to happen. While the man slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. So God, I think, here is performing the first surgery on a sedated patient. Verse 22, the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now listen to the implications of that principle. God doesn't give Adam an animal, therefore bestiality is excluded. God doesn't give... Adam another man, therefore homosexuality is excluded. God doesn't give Adam two women, therefore polygamy is excluded. God doesn't give Adam an image of a woman, therefore pornography is excluded. God doesn't give Adam a woman to date without lifelong commitment, therefore premarital sexual relations are excluded. God gives Adam one woman for life in a monogamous co covenant relationship. Because that's what's good. And that's God's idea. And that's what's right. Verse 23, 
Then the man said, and it, it, he actually sung this, uh, the Hebrew indicates, this is at last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. He names her. Because she was taken out of man. And he names himself man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. There's a lot of beginnings that are happening right there. We have the first father giving away his daughter in marriage. We have the first bride who is beautiful and spotless. We have the first minister performing the first marriage ceremony, and it's all free. This is back when marriages were free and weddings were free. Um, they didn't have to spend money on decorations. The whole garden's beautifully uh, adorned. They have perfect weather. They don't need to spend money on food. Everything's there and provided. They don't have to spend money on a honeymoon because they're in Eden. Um, I, I really think that every wedding ceremony, every honeymoon, is actually trying to go back and replicate the first one. And a lot of money and a lot of stress and a lot of work goes into trying to replicate what they had in this first marriage. And that's not a bad thing. It's just what happens outside of Eden. Uh, they sealed their marriage covenant, not just with public vows, but a consummation. Verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So they're now covenantally bound in one flesh promise. Promise, uh, which is what really gets at the essence of covenant. Uh, someone actually said covenant is, is making an appointment to be with you in the future. So a husband saying, I make an appointment to be your husband in the future. So death to his part. That's covenant. Um, I remember the, the day uh, that I stood over 15 years ago, made a covenant to Priscilla and said these words, I, John Mark, take you, Priscilla, to be my wife. I covenant before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful husband as long as we both shall live. And I meant those words uh, 15 years ago. But three years after we said them, I was 23 when I said those the first time. So I'm 26. And Priscilla says to me, Basically the same words again, but three years later. And it was just a random conversation. I don't remember what provoked it. We're just sitting somewhere and she says, you know, no matter what you do, I'm not going to leave you. And that landed very different three years into the marriage because we'd had fights and she'd seen sin. And, 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 and all the, the parts of me that in our dating context can be hidden, aren't hidden once you've been married for three years. And then to say those vows, they're the same vows, but they land different. That's, that's the power uh, of covenant. Uh, Lewis Meads wrote an article back in the 80s called The Power of Promising about the marriage covenant. And he said, my wife has been married to five men, every one of them has been me. His point was, you change and your spouse changes, but the promise doesn't change. We know, we know those of us especially who've been married any length of time, the, the person that we promised to be married to at the wedding altar isn't the same person we're married to today. They've changed. Maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, but they're not the same, and we're not the same. There's a sense in which there's a lot of change that happens in people's lives. But what doesn't change in the context of marriage is the promise. It is an unchanging covenant that remains. And this is the difference between the biblical idea of covenant and what people call contracts. There's contractual marriages, which many people have, which is basically just, we're going to enter into this relationship as long as it goes well, as long as you love me how I want to be loved, as long as this is working out, we'll stay together. As soon as things aren't so good, we can end this. That's contractual marriage. Covenant marriage 
is very different. Malachi says it like this, The Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth. She is your wife by covenant. What's the difference? God is there. Binding the two. In their presence as they make their promise. Now think, think again for a minute about what's happening here. You have God taking one man, Adam, making two. Now you've got Adam and Eve. And then he takes the two and then makes them one again. And you go, well, why would God do that? He just started with one. Why would he make them two and then make them one again? What's the purpose? And the answer is that God wanted a richer and more textured oneness. He multiplied the one and made two, then joined them back together to make a more complete oneness. So division occurred in order to attain a higher type of unity. Which makes sense when you remember the God who designed this. Who's Trinitarian. He wants His image bearers to have a Trinitarian flavor to their oneness. Now, think of the only other options. If this isn't the way it works, what are our only options? Unity with no diversity. Only diversity and fragmentation. So you take, for example, uh, if Allah made, uh, people in his, made people in His image, they would all be just unities with no diversity. If Hinduism and, and all the many millions of gods created, uh, they would create uh, just chaotic, diverse. So you've got uh, a monolithic sameness, or you've got a polytheistic chaos and diversity. Those are the secular, unbelieving options. But you come to the Bible, and you have a Trinitarian God, who out of his oneness with diversity, creates a oneness with diversity. And I, I'm not just speculating that. Uh, the word one, when it says they, the two became one, that, that word there uh, it also shows up in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Ehad, that, one, that word right there, the same word is used about marriage with the two becoming one. And so it's not a numerical uh, one. It is a, a, a one with multiples. A unity of multiples. The same word used for Trinity with one is the one flesh marriage. So a unity of multiples. Genesis 1.26 Let us make man in our image. Trinitarian. After our likeness. And it goes on. So that God created the man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female. He created them. And there's a weird verse uh, that I've been thinking a lot on for years. Many people don't even think about this verse. It's a very strange verse in Malachi 2, uh, verse 14 and 15. But listen to this. She is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of his spirit in their union? And I've read many, many, many commentaries on that over the years. And nobody seems to understand what it means that he gave them a portion of, their, of his spirit in their union. And I'm not here to solve that conclusively right now. But it is interesting that it says it took two, made them one in covenant, and then gave a portion of the spirit. That's a threeness. Two bound together with the Trinity. With a portion of the spirit. Like Proverbs, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Christian husband, Christian wife, Spirit of God. Listen to Richard Kogan uh, said this, The doctrine of the Trinity which Jesus and the Scripture endorses and teach also profoundly affects Christian marriage. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in a permanent, plural, equal, complementarian, ordered, and loving union. Since we are created like God, we thrive in marriage relationships that, or, that mirror His Trinitarian union. Since God is permanent, He designed for us to have lasting marriages, not divorce. Since God is love unconditionally, He designed our marital love to be unconditional. Since God is triune, He designed marriage 
of intimate companionship to counter loneliness. Since God is three equal persons, He designed marriage in which husbands and wives are equally dignified. Since God is diverse and complementary, and complementary, he created husbands and wife to reflect that diver- that diversity and complementarianism. And since God is Trinity, he ordered the Father and the Spirit, or the Son and the Spirit, to gladly submit to the Father. He designed uh, all human relationships with this, including marriage, with an authority to be exercised lovingly and a submission to be given willingly. End quote. So practically. Uh, Here's how this matters. It says he will make a helper. Helper. Many people think that sounds really derogatory. Well, not when you remember that the Holy Spirit is called helper. Equally, uh, one of the Godhead with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, yet taking on willingly the role of submission. You see how the Trinity helps us see the sameness or the unity of, Uh, with diversity. Uh, One theologian said something a little provocative if you don't understand what he's saying. He said, never are we more like God than when we enter into a covenant marriage. Now what he's not meaning is that morally we just become very Christ-like just because we get married. We all know that's not what he's saying or he's wrong. What he's meaning is the nature of our relationship in marriage that two become one is very similar to a triune God where multiples are one. There's a likeness that we display in our marriages that is like God's. Guys, look, marriage is very sacred. I hope we're just beginning to feel this thing is way bigger than just I hope my spouse starts getting along with me, does all the stuff I want him to do. (laughs) <laughs> All right, uh, it's going to be many weeks before we even get to that type of discussion. Th- this is profound. And all I'm trying to do in this series is basically just lay the table for us and, 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 and two categories for us to see. There is a, a unity that God creates in marriage, a oneness that is so deeply profound, you have to begin to compare it to the Trinity. And then there's a diversity that beautifully is displayed in marriage that you have to begin to display, uh, compare it to the Trinity. You, you feel there, there's some massive amount of glory and sacredness in marriage that I think we have lost in many ways. Um, I want to move us to the table and try to give us a thought to connect marriage to the table Um, next week we're going to get into, I think I'm most excited in this series about next week's sermon. I want us us to see how the whole Bible is really a story about marriage. Um, When you start in Genesis, you see marriage. Genesis 2, we're seeing marriage. And then when you get all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation, those last three chapters of Revelation, marriage. And what is happening in that last marriage? You have a wedding supper of the Lamb. Christ and His bride together for a meal. A wedding feast. I want to just submit to you that this is a preparatory meal for that one. We've talked about this. There's something more mysterious happening at this table when we take this by faith between us and Christ. There's a communion between the bride of Christ and Christ at the table. Why? It's a preparatory meal for a coming marriage supper between the bride of Christ and Christ Himself. Let's renew our minds in these things and prepare ourselves to go to the table. If you're new, the way we approach this, uh, we believe the Scripture teaches that uh, one must have believed the Gospel, received Christ, and been baptized, uh, and then we would we would welcome you to come with us. Uh, if you'll be refraining, you can find in your bulletin some meaningful prayers uh, for you if you'll be refraining from the table. Uh, let's seek the Lord and prepare our hearts for the table. Father, Lord, we thank You that You've given us this table to remember 
that there is a marriage supper coming. There is a wedding supper between your bride and the groom who has pursued this bride, who has perfected and purified this bride. Lord, would you exalt our views of marriage? Would you lift up out of the the sewage of our cultural discussions on marriage and and gender and sexuality? Would you lift it up and clean it off? Would you purify our minds and make this sacred so that we can love our spouse as well and demonstrate the glory of your gospel as it truly is? Lord, we love you, and we pray all these things in the name of your Son. Amen.